My sermon title today, Can You Really Handle the Truth? John 1 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and John 8, 32, then you will know the, and the will set you free. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Romans 1, 25, they exchanged the about God for a lie, worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. So my question today is, can you handle the truth? Sometimes the truth's a big, loud wake-up call, you know. We try to avoid the truth in a lot of situations. In his letter to the church, Jude tells the truth. But can we really handle the truth he's telling us? Now, we know that there's absolute truth in science and math, but there's also absolute truth in spiritual things. And I firmly believe that we can know spiritual truth. Dr. Walter Martin, I've read his books a great uh, theologian and a great writer on cults. He said this, into this whirlpool of stagnant human philosophy and perverted revelation came the Son of God, who through his teachings and example revealed that there was such a thing as divine humanity and through his miraculous powers, vicarious death and bodily res resurrection cut across the maze of human doubts and fears and was lifted up to draw all men unto himself. It's been wisely observed that men are at liberty to reject Christ and the Bible and the word of God. They're at liberty to oppose him. They're at liberty to challenge him and it, but they are not at liberty to alter the essential message of the scriptures, which is the good news that God does care for lost souls. You know, we've got to take care of fundamentals. Sometimes we get way over on the sidelines and outside the boundaries of where God wants us to be. We must know the truth and live out that truth on a daily basis. I mean, know the name Bobby Bowden. Most, most men would know Florida State coach for 150 years, it seemed like. He was there forever. But in college, he played baseball. And he had a revelation that happened to him. During one of his early games, his first year in college baseball, he managed to hit a ball down the right field line into the corner, and he rounded first, looked at the coach, the coach waved him to second, he ran to second, the coach waved him to third, he ran to third, the coach waved him home. And everybody was jubilant. He had hit his first home run of his career. But then after the jubilation kind of died down, the pitcher took the ball, threw it to the first baseman. First baseman stepped on the base, and the umpire called him out. In all the excitement, he had failed to touch first base. I heard him say one time on an interview, if you don't take care of first base, it really doesn't matter what else you do. It's really true. Jude 1, if you have your Bibles, turn to Jude 1. Take a few scriptures. I'll take a few moments here to explain to you. This is our text today. Jude was writing to the church a letter of encouragement, but then it turned a little different as he wrote. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, that's the church, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Underline that in your Bible if you have not yet. Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't keep Take care of first base. Doesn't matter much what else you do. So can you handle this truth this morning? The truth is this. If you don't contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints, if we don't make it a point in this church to touch first base with that, we're really going to mess things up. I believe there are too many groups of people who miss first base. 
They need to go back to the foundation principles of who we are and what we are. I was recently watching a documentary on counterfeit money. And I learned that the American Banking Association has a school that goes on for a few weeks for tellers. And they go through this school. And during that weeks of training, they never once touch a counterfeit dollar bill. Only the real thing. So that when the counterfeit comes along, she or he is not fooled. They, by their touch, can tell the difference. And the fact is, while businesses are losing millions of dollars in revenue in counterfeit dollar bills, $20 and $100 bills, we're also losing millions of lives to the counterfeit gospel. You've heard me say to you over and over again through these four years that we've been in this church, do not believe me. I hope I can say what I say in a way that you do believe me, but always, always check out what I say here and any other gospel that you're hearing. Go back to the source, back to the word, verify, trust. I think Reagan said trust, but verify. The word is the foundation of our faith. And we must stay with it. And that phrase, the faith, refers to the body of Christians, that, of believers that have these truths in common. This faith has been entrusted. He said, contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints, entrusted into our care and keeping. God has said to this generation, I'm going to leave you with my truth. When he went away, he entrusted it to 12 men and then 120 and then thousands, and now us, can we handle the truth? What are we doing with the truth? God's saying, I believe I can trust you to take care of the truth and pass it on to the next generation. I remember hearing someone say God has no grandchildren. And that's true. We all come to him on our own. We all have a personal relationship or we have no relationship. You know, there's, uh, it's been said that Christianity is always only one generation away from extinction. If we don't teach our children, and our world today is showing that so vividly, so graphically, in the way young people are treating who God is and what the Word of God says. If we don't fight for what is right, we have nothing left to pass on to our children and our grandchildren and the heritage that we have known. In the South, when... A man says, when he insults you, a man says, those are fighting words. I mean, know what that means. That means you care deeply enough about something to protect it. And there are times when I hear stuff on TV or hear it on the radio, and I go, those are fighting words right there. I mean, I want to protect the word of God. I want to protect the, the value that it has in my life. I want to protect the credibility and the validity. You know, designer religions flourishing. Whatever you think is right, then that's right for everyone else. And we just won't bother you. We're learning to be tolerant. Tolerance seems to only go one way, the way I see it. Traditional Christianity is being undermined by counterfeit, counterfeit, counterfeit religion and gospels. In verse 4, uh, Jude there says we have to contend. That means we have to fight for it. He says, godless men will change the grace of God into a license for immorality. They'll deny Jesus Christ, our sovereign, our only Lord. They'll deny him. And verse 5 goes on to say, this will lead to some non-believing and facing judgment from God. Uh, and verses 6 and 7 goes on to tell us that God will bring damnation on those who rebel because of a lack of faithfulness in contending for the faith. We have a great responsibility placed on our shoulders. God has challenged us to keep the word right and pure and holy as it is and to keep it in our hearts and live our lives in a way that will cause others to see who Jesus is in us. Let me ask you a question. If all 12 of his disciples were living their lives exactly like you, would you and the other 11 have been able to accomplish the task that he gave them? If your life 
was the example of who Jesus is as he left and went in, went into heaven. And he said, I leave it with you. We know plan A. There's a story that said Gabriel asked God, if this doesn't work, he's going to leave all this with all these 12 guys down there. What, what's plan B? And God said, there is no plan B. This has to work. And it's the same today. Philippians 127, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, Paul says, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. We as Christians stand cowards in a corner too much of the time, afraid to speak the word of God. I'm here to tell you today, this expressed concern that Jude had and Paul had needs to be understood today. Contending for the faith is not complacency that's congealing somewhere. It's confronting our culture with the word of God, not being afraid to stand up and be counted for what we know is truth. Can we handle the truth of the word of God? Matthew 16, 18 says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In one way, that's kind of a strange statement <laughs> because gates are a defensive mechanism. They're a protection. How many have ever had a gate attack you lately? <laughs> I've never heard of a story where a gate attacked anybody. So the gates of hell don't attack us, but they try to keep us from doing the will of God. And what he's saying is all around you, there are things that are coming at you, but those gates of hell that are opening internet, television, movies, magazines, books, information. We live in an information age and the gates of hell are coming at us. They're opened so that the flow of hell's message comes at us, but we can't allow it to dilute the truth of the word of God. Luke 19, 23, Jesus said, occupy until he comes. And some would like that to say, well, we'll just sit back and take up space until Jesus comes again. We'll just sit and soak. We won't do anything. We won't be active. We'll just, we just know that we're saved and we've got our, our fire escape from hell now. And so we're just going to kind of protect our territory and we're not going to really reach out, but we're going to just be here. What Christ was saying was engage in kingdom business until he comes again. Win as many as you can. He's asking for us to take the truth and handle it well until he comes. Be active, be participants. Christianity spread rapidly in the first century. We know that story. All of us know that story. Christians, here's why. Christians saw themselves as responsible for disseminating the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have fallen into a pattern of uh, being comfortable that the television's going to do it and that the preacher's going to do it and that the radio program is going to do it, but we're not going to do it. But that's wrong. The church is under orders. Are we, are, are we the army of God? I mean, are we soldiers in the army of God? Evangelistic inactivity is disobedience to the commission of Jesus Christ. We must win souls. The church must go into the world because the world is not going to come into the church. My dad used to say, we got to be fishers of men. You can put a boat in the lake and put a sign on it that says fish welcome jump in. But you'll never catch a fish. You have to put some bait on a hook and put it in the water. This is, this is what we become. Sinners welcome, kind of, but we want a certain kind of sinner. We want a nice sinner. We don't want an ugly sinner. We don't want a bad sinner. We just want a, we want a good sinner. We like, we kind of like good sinners. And if you come in and join us and all you good sinners, you're welcome. Now, if you're a bad sinner, we might check you at the door, frisk you a little bit, but that's not who Jesus came for. Jesus came not to condemn, but to save. You couldn't get too dirty for Jesus to love. You couldn't be too bad for Jesus to love you. Mark 16, 15, he said to us, we like to read it. And he said to them, 
No, he said to us, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to all this creation, to every man, woman, boy, and girl in Haiti, in Dominican, in the Philippines, in Mexico, in Sweden, in Branson, in New York City, in Los Angeles. Go get them, Jesus said. And I think Jesus is saying, stop being so lazy. Stop being so self-centered. A violinist named Luigi Teresa was found dead one morning. Had His home was kind of a wreck. He had nothing. He was eating out of the garbage sometimes, out of uh, old cans of food. But in the home, they found 246 exquisite violins. He had them stuffed in the attic, in closets, in wherever you could put them. And the one best one he had in a old dresser drawer there in his bedroom. And that one was a Stradivarius. They cleaned it up after his death. They cleaned up that Stradivarius and all those violins. And a master violinist picked up that Stradivarius and began to play. And it was absolutely amazing music. First time it had been played, they supposed, in over 100 years. This man was devoted to violins. He loved violins. He collected them. He had them everywhere. But all those years, the beauty of those violins was missing because they were hidden. They were stuck away somewhere. They were not where people could enjoy the beauty of that music. And I think the church has become lame in its existence, hidden away within walls like these, where the world out there doesn't know the beauty of the music played in the Holy Spirit of God through the love of Jesus Christ. Let's get our violins out, folks. Let's dust them off. Let's tighten the strings. Let's get the bow. Let's begin to play the love of Jesus in the lives of people. Let's begin to let them hear what we know that God can do for their lives. Jude 1, 4 again. Certain men whose condemnation was written have secretly slipped in among you. They have, they're godless men. They've changed the grace of God into a license for immorality. Here's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, great theologian. He said, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without repentance. Hello? Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without personal confession. He said, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ alive in us. We cannot preach grace without following the word. Jesus must be alive in us so that the grace we preach is shown in the way we live. Some churches preach cheap grace. I believe in grace. I believe Oh, thank God for grace. I love that little illustration Sandy did. But we can't have cheap grace. It is the blood of Jesus. It is the cross of Christ. Because this cheap grace is an actual perversion of the grace of God. Um, Jude in uh, verses 22, 23 says, Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Hmm. He says to show mercy. But he says, watch out, lest you yourself should be contaminated by cheap grace, by the message that's not of the gospel, by the message that's not of the purity of the word of God, the message without obedience, the message without compassion, the message without love. A lot of people just take the word of grace and they say, well, I can do whatever I want. That's not the God. That's not God's intention. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you this morning, our opportunities to share Christ in a dark world have never been greater. There's a world out there. Now, you got to know your stuff. The problem with a lot of Christians is they don't know what they believe. They don't know what the word says. They don't, so they're afraid to say anything because somebody with a good philosophical argument will talk them under the table. That's why studying the word. That's why discipleship. That's why I come on Wednesday night. That's why I get good CDs. That's why I listen to, to tapes where you know the truth of the word of God. People are asking questions about God today as never before. I'm telling you, people are aware of God, but they're aware of him in the sense of Buddha and in the sense of Confucius and the New Age gospel and the doctrines of man. And what we are, 
are people who stand with the word of God, the truth in our hearts, in our lives, in our voice, in our minds. The grace of God, Titus 2.11 says, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say, verse 12, no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, to purify himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. See, contending for the faith is not some unconscious contentment It is conscious comprehension of what the word says. There's a couple of reasons for us to be knowledgeable, you know, one to defend against corruption because of apathy. And second, to be able to give a logical answer for our faith when asked. If Somebody challenges you about your faith. Do you have, do you know enough to tell them what it is you believe and why it can be very simple doesn't have to be deep theolog- theological answers. If you get beyond where you are and say, well, I don't know. I, hey, I say it all the time to people. Hey, what about this verse? And what, what, about, what does that mean? I say, you know what? I'll be glad to get back to you. Or let's sit down. And we'll, we'll read it together. We'll run some references. We'll find out. Because I don't know everything. And neither do you. I understand that. I don't have all the answers. But this does. And so if it's an area where you're not well schooled, tell somebody. I don't know, but I'll get back to you. Can I have your phone number? I'll call you and then be diligent and go do it. Go find out, get the answer they're looking for and cause them to come to know Jesus Christ in reality. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason of hope in you. Why, why do you have such hope? Somebody will say, you need to know what to tell them. Not because it's sun shining or not because you've got a new car. It's because Jesus Christ is the living hope in you. He has saved me. That's why I have such hope. Glory to God. Can you handle the truth? Can you deliver the truth? Can you talk about the truth? You will know the truth when you know the truth, Jesus said. Then you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. But not only you, those around you will be set free as well by the truth. Can you handle this? Preaching the cross is foolishness to those being lost. But to those of us who are being saved on a constant basis by the power of Jesus. It is the power of God into salvation. Glory to God. So our prayer should be this. God, give us a foundation on which to stand. Because unless we stand for something, we're going to fall for anything. We've got to know what we believe. Proverbs 23, 23 says, get the truth and never sell it. Get wisdom, discipline, and good judgment. Don't let go of the truth. Know the truth. Contending for the faith is not being coldly cantankerous. You know, there are some Christians who are just cantankerous with what they know. And if you don't believe it like they believe it, they're going to beat you up with the Bible and hit you over the head with everything they can and try to cause you to think exactly like, you know, I'm sure there are many of us in here who don't believe everything I believe. And that's okay. I give you freedom to believe as long as it's based in the word. So it's not coldly cantankerous, but compassionate concern. We heard it from the Haiti people today. Well, they're not Haiti people, but they, well, sounds like one of them is going to be a Haiti people, a 13 year old Tabitha. She's going to join our granddaughter probably in that same place. If she goes back to there, we've got a 12 year old granddaughter who says the same thing Tabitha said. I'm going to the mission field. I'm going to Haiti. I'm going, I'm going where, where I can love people. Be merciful to those who doubt. It says save others by snatching them from the fire. See, a lot of people think to stand up for the truth, they've got to be obstinate and obnoxious, hard-nosed. Let me tell you something. Jesus wasn't that way. He was that way with the church, the Pharisees. But his heart was compassionate for sinners. He loved them with a soft love, with a love that he showed us how to love others. What we have to understand is love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Did you know that? Force won't do it. War won't do it. Hateful words won't do it. Even the, 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 the structure of obedience alone won't do it. There has to be grace, to, grace attached to it. Matthew 5, 43. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, Jesus talking, I say, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. And this is the hard part, isn't it? Do good See, we can love them in our hearts, but when he says, 
do good. That means an active participation in their life in goodness. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you well. These are incredibly exciting days to be alive. You know that? And when we look at what Jude is saying, let me read the end of that little one chapter book. Verse 24, give us the reason for our hope. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Verse 25, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. That encompasses everything. That's all the past. That's all the present. And that's all the future. Listen, let the people of God be rejoiced and uh, rejoicing and encouraged because we can handle the truth. This is what we have to understand. When we finally get to heaven, we're going to say, hallelujah, by God's grace, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. But until then, keep your chin up and your knees down. That'll make a difference in your life. When you understand who you are and who he is in you, it'll change your life. Keep serving, keep smiling, keep praying, keep believing, keep expecting and sharing Christ wherever you go. There's no greater thrill than seeing the truth win in a life that you felt like maybe they would never come to know Jesus. But all of a sudden, because of the sharing of the truth, can you handle it? Can you handle the truth of the word? Can you give it out? Can you, can you pass it on to generation after generation? Can you, can you let God do in you what he's called us all to do?